Um, <clears throat> someone is also asking uh, for a clarification on um, this idea of Jesus, I guess, limiting himself freely. Yeah, no, well, no, he, he chose to take on a genuine human nature and experience genuine human limitations mm -hmm. without ceasing to be God. See, this is the thing. As God, he's not limited, but he's also human. And in that human life that he lived, he experienced genuine human limitations. Like he got tired. He got hungry. He needed to sleep. <clears throat> you know, he had to travel from place to place. <clears throat> he grew. He went from being in his mother's womb to coming out as a baby, to becoming a toddler, to an adolescent. These are the human limitations that he experienced. But as God, he's ever living. And he still possessed the fullness of deity <clears throat> while flesh, while living a human life and experiencing genuine human limitations. Yeah. That's what the Bible teaches. Now, what did I say earlier? The Bible just presents facts, but it doesn't systematize those facts. It doesn't bring those facts together and explain how it works. So it's left for us to try to figure it out. But so are other statements that show that when Jesus is on earth, he's also all knowing. This is a mistake many Christians make, and I used to make it until by the grace of God, I learned better. Well, Jesus emptied himself. Well, what in the world does that mean? It means nothing because that's misquoting Paul. When Paul says Jesus emptied himself, Paul is not talking about emptying himself of any divine attribute as some think, not you guys, some think that. But the context is he emptied himself of his status and glory to take on the status of a slave and make himself nothing. That's the contextual reading of Philippians 2. Let's go and look at it. Because Paul explains the nature of the emptying. He emptied himself by leaving his exalted status where he manifested his glory in heaven seated on the throne with the father to appear on earth as a slave whom no one recognized was their creator it says nothing about him veiling his divine attributes yeah he veiled his glory meaning you couldn't look at him until that's god as you could when he's in heaven but people talk about veiling his attributes what does that mean what attribute how do you veil attributes attributes are not something you see it's something that <clears throat> are exhibited by your actions mm -hmm. right you see your attributes by your actions right yeah so what did he veil i mean there, in other words his attribute of love isn't five foot ten 200 pounds that was veiled love these attributes are actions that are exhibited when jesus acts upon one of those characteristics in other words when he's loving you that's his attribute of love right yeah but it'll be more clear as I unpack it. Go to Philippians 2, 5 to 7 so we can get this canard out of the way to show you that contrary to what some Christians will tell you, Jesus was both omnipresent and limited, both omniscient and also had to grow in wisdom and knowledge. It's not either or. It's both and. And it's I'm going to prove it. And. Just wait. Give me a chance to unpack it slowly. But go to Philippians 2, 5 to 7 and read it. All right. Have this mind among yourselves which is yours in Christ Jesus, who, though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, mm -hmm. but emptied himself by taking the form there of you a go. servant. There you go. How did he empty himself? By taking the form of a it servant. It has nothing to do with attributes. It has to do with status. He went from the exalted status of God Almighty, reigning with the Father, John 17, 5. Now, Father, glorify me together alongside yourself with the glory I had with you before the world was. To taking now the status of a slave, making himself of no reputation, so that when you looked at him, you didn't recognize that's a creator. Yeah. Again, the King James Version captures it perfectly. It says, making himself of no reputation. Mm, I see. That's good. The context is status. <clears throat> he goes from having the status of God and the glory that belongs to it to the status of a slave to being exalted to the status of a god again philippians 2 9 therefore god highly exalted him and gave him the name name here means the authority position and status that goes with being jehovah so this is misused this passage is misused yep. now i'm going to prove to you jesus is all-knowing and omnipresent while he's on earth can i show that to you 
Yes, let's do it. Go to Mark 7, 24 to 30. Mark 7. 24 to 30. It says this. And from there he arose and went away to the region of Tyre and Sidon. And he entered a house and did not want anyone to know, yet he could not be hidden. But immediately a woman whose little daughter had an unclean spirit heard of him and came and fell down at his feet. Now the woman was a Gentile, a Syrophoenician by birth, and she begged him to cast the demon out of her, out of her daughter. <clears throat> and he said to her, let the children be fed first, for it is not right to take the children's bread and throw it to the dogs. But she answered him, yes, Lord, yet even the dogs under the table eat the children's crumbs. And he said to her, for this statement, you may go your way. The demon has left your daughter. Now notice, Jesus physically <clears throat> is not at the house where the daughter is. He's physically in a different location, but he's already cast out the demon from where her daughter is without being there physically. And then verse 30, when she gets there, what does she find? She finds that her, and when she went home and found the child lying in bed and the demon gone. So wait, Jesus wasn't there physically, and yet he still cast out the demon and knew the demon had left without there, without being there physically. Without How? being there physically. How? Because that's his divine attributes. Because he's omnipresent. As God, he's still omnipresent overseeing all creation. So he doesn't have to be there physically to command demons out or heal. I'm going to give you other examples. I gave you this from Mark because they'll say, oh, well, you can't show me that from Mark. Yes, I can. Right, right, right. Okay, now let me show you some other examples. Go to John 1, 45 to 49. Philip findeth Nathanael and saith unto him, We have found him, of whom Moses in the law and the prophets did write, Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Joseph. And Nathanael said unto him, Can there any good thing come out of Nazareth? Philip saith unto him, Come and see. Jesus saw Nathanael coming to him and saith of him, Behold, an Israelite indeed, in whom is no guile. Nathanael saith unto him, Whence knowest thou me? Jesus now before you move on, let me explain why Jesus yes. said that. When Nathanael reacted and said, Nazareth, man, that place is the dump, dude. Nothing good comes out of that because he was being a zealous, like, patriot like a zealous Jew, because Nazareth had been infested by Gentile occupation, right? That's right. And so he's exhibiting his zeal for it. What? Nazareth? Man, profit from there? Are you kidding me? That dump? So Jesus says, ah, here's a zealous Israelite, zealous patriot. You understand Jesus' reaction now? Yep. Right. Yep. And so, well, <laughs> Nathaniel asked the obvious question. How do you know me? It's the first time you're seeing me. And now notice what Jesus responds. Nathanael saith unto him, Whence knowest thou me? Jesus answered and said unto him, Before that Philip called thee, when thou wast under the fig tree, I saw thee. How did he see him? He wasn't physically there. Right. Because he's all seeing. And that's what blew Nathanael away. What? Rabbi, you are the Christ, the Son of God, the King of Israel, right? That's right. Correct. So did Jesus lose his omnipresence on earth? No. Oh. Whoever tells you otherwise, they're not reading Scripture carefully. Go to John 4, 43 to 54. John 4, 43. Now after two days he departed thence and went into Galilee. For Jesus himself testified that a prophet hath no honor in his own country. Then when he was come into Galilee, the Galileans received him, having seen all the things that he did at Jerusalem at the feast, for they also went unto the feast. So Jesus came again into Cana of Galilee, where he had made the water wine. And there was a certain nobleman whose son was sick of Capernaum. When he heard that Jesus was come out of Judea into Galilee, he went unto him and besought him that he would come down and heal his son. 
for he was at the point of death. Then Jesus said unto him, Except ye see signs and wonders, ye will not believe. The nobleman saith unto him, Sir, come down ere my child die. Jesus saith unto him, Go thy way, thy son liveth. Now notice, it is Jesus who's doing the miracles because they're asking him to do it. And without being there, he said he's already healed. Go your way. Now watch yeah. what happens. Look how long it takes the man to reach his home. Look how long it takes, guys. And the man believed the word that Jesus had spoken unto him, and he went his way. And as he was now going down, his servants met him and told him, saying, Thy son liveth. Then inquired he of them the hour when he began to amend. And they said unto him, Yesterday, at the seventh hour, the fever left him. It took him a whole day to arrive home. Yesterday, it left him at the seventh hour, right? That's correct. But now notice why that hour is important, because notice what the text says. So the father knew that it was at that same hour in the which Jesus said unto him, Thy son liveth, and himself believed in his whole house. Did you catch it? Yesterday at the seventh hour is when Jesus said, Your son is whole. Go. It took him the next day to arrive, and the servant said, Oh, he got healed yesterday at that hour. He goes, But that's the hour that Jesus told me, Go, your son lives. How did Jesus enact a miraculous healing without physically being there and know the boy was healed and he's alive, he's not going to die. Because he's all-seeing, all-knowing, and omnipresent. Even. So when did he cease to be omnipresent, omniscient? He never, never did. Never. This is bad theology, folks. I don't care who you hear it from. It's not what the Scripture says. I'm showing you what the Scripture says, right? Yeah. Now, do the same Scriptures testify that Jesus knew everything on earth? Oh, yeah. Let me show it to you. Go to John 2, 23 to 25. We're going to work our way back to Mark. For sure. Now, when he was in Jerusalem at the Passover in the feast day, many believed in his name when they saw the miracles which he did. But Jesus did not commit himself unto them because he knew all men and needed not that any should testify of man, for he knew what was in man. So notice, he knows all men. He knows their nature inside and out. Amen. Now, let's go to this one. It's going to be a, an embarrassment for those who try to say, well, Jesus is speaking poetically or allegorically. This one, if there's one passage you need to remember is this one, because this buries the argument that it's Jesus simply speaking allegorically or hy hyperbolically or metaphorically. Go to John 16, 25 to 31. Mm -hmm. These things I have spoken unto you in Proverbs. But the time cometh when I shall no more speak unto you in Proverbs. Now notice, Proverbs here means figuratively. Uh, yeah. Time coming, I won't speak figuratively. <clears throat> so how is he going to speak to them? Literally, plainly. Well, let's see what he says. But I shall shew you plainly of the Father. And that day ye, sh ye shall ask in my name, and I say not unto you, that I will pray the Father for you. For the Father himself loveth you, because ye have loved me, and have believed that I came out from God, and I came forth from the Father, and am come into the world. Again, I leave the world, and go to the Father. His disciples said unto him, Lo, now speakest thou plainly. Notice, you're speaking literally, plainly, <clears throat> not figuratively, so they can't explain this away, right? Yeah. Read 29 again. His disciples said unto him, Lo, now speaketh thou plainly, and speakest no proverb. Now are we sure that thou knowest all things? Wait, so you mean now that you're speaking plainly, now we realize you're omniscient, you know everything? Hmm. Incredible. And then what else did he go on and say? And needest not that any man should ask thee. Now what that means is, you'll find this in the Gospels. You can ask questions because you're learning or ask questions to test someone to see if they know what they're talking about. Yeah. And Jesus did it often. The Christ, whose son is he? When they answered fault you know, incorrectly, he then schooled them. So they're saying, we don't need to question you anymore to see if you know what you're talking about. 
Because yeah. now that you're speaking plainly, not figuratively, we get it. You know everything. And then notice what they go on to say in Jesus' response. By this we believe that thou camest forth from God. Jesus an answered them, Do ye now believe? You finally got it? Took you long enough. Yeah. So notice what they got when Jesus started speaking plainly, not allegorically. You came down from the Father himself. You came out of the Father himself, entered the world, and you're going back to the Father, leaving the world. So now we got it. You're not of this world. You're of the Father. You came out of him from heaven into the world. You're leaving the world and going to the Father from whom you came. That's plain as day. We get it. Now we believe it. And you know everything. Don't need to be questioned to see if you know what you're talking about. Wow. But this is on earth before his death. So the people who say, well, yeah, he, did, he was not omniscient. Where are you getting this from, man? He was omniscient, omnipresent, omnipotent. But at the same time, he's not just God. He's also truly human. And because he's truly human, he experienced genuine human limitations. He grew. He got tired. He got hungry. He needed to sleep. He needed to travel from place to place. Right? So these are all true. It's not either or. So... You fall for it when he said you believe Jesus is God? No, complete the thought. The God man. Mm -hmm. But you let them say you believe Jesus is God? Yeah. No, he's the God man. He's God who became man. So if you're going to talk to me about Jesus, you're going to have to bring both natures into view yep. and both facts. Now, did he know everything after his resurrection? Yeah. John yep. 21, 17. Three weeks after his resurrection, the disciples are fishing and Jesus appears on the shore you know, early in the morning and he's cooking fish for them. And then he asks Peter, if you go to John 21, 15 to 17, he asks Peter three times, Simon, son of Jonah, John, do you love me more than these? Yes, Lord, you know, I love you. Now the third time Peter gets hurt. Look what it says in John 21, 17. John 21, 17. He saith unto him the third time, Simon, son of Jonas, Lovest thou me? Peter was grieved because he said unto him the third time, Lovest thou me? And he said unto him, Lord, thou knowest all things. Thou knowest that I love thee. In other words, why are you asking? You already know everything. What's there to for you to ask? See? So Peter is telling him, Lord, I already know you know everything. So you already know whether I love you or not. So why do you need to ask me three times? Yeah. So it's not hyperbole, it's literal. Lord, I'm hurt that you're asking me three times because you didn't need to even ask me the first time because you know everything. You know whether I love you or not. So he's omniscient before and after. Now, one more passage that this is found in the majority of the Greek copies of John, ancient versions, and many early church fathers cite this, which sadly, Many translations that prioritize the earlier Greek papyri lack it, but they'll admit we have many early copies, many church fathers, and the majority of our Greek witnesses, which are from a later period, that have this line. So yeah. it should be there. It's John 3.13, which you'll find in the King James, New King James, Modern English Version. What does it say? John 3.13. Right, John 3.13. And no man hath ascended up to heaven, but he that came down from heaven, even the Son of Man, which is in heaven. Oh, he's still in heaven while he's on earth? <laughs> he's still in heaven while he's on earth. Well, physically he's not in heaven. Physically he's on earth. But because he's God, he fills heaven and earth and sustains heaven and earth with the Father and the Spirit. Now, yep, now Sam, can you can you break down really quick, you know, the argument that, oh, what about Elijah and Enoch? Didn't they ascend into heaven? Oh, or... that's a pathetic argument mm -hmm. because Jesus's point is not about ascending. It's about coming down with the mysteries of heaven. Mm. Did Elijah and Enoch ever come down to reveal heaven? Nope. Jesus alone comes down from heaven as a man to tell you the mysteries of heaven. That's the contextual reading. Don't read that 313. Read John 3, 10 to 13. I see that's his point. Yep, I see it right now, yep. Now, here's what's amazing though. After Jesus' resurrection, mm -hmm. Paul and 
John were allowed to enter heaven and see its mysteries. Then John was allowed to record it. Yeah. But notice this is after Jesus, right? Yep. Before Jesus, no. When they went, they stayed. Yeah, that makes sense. Can I uh, read these verses really quick? Yeah, you need this? to. John 3, 10 to 13. Yep. So it says, Jesus answered him, are you the teacher of are you the teacher of Israel? And yet you do not understand these things. So the context is he's talking to Nicodemus, for those who do not know. Yeah. Um, verse 11. Truly, truly, I say to you, we speak of what we know and bear witness to what we have seen. But you do not receive our testimony. Who's the we? The Father and the Son. And the Holy Spirit. The Spirit. Yeah. There's that divine we that we find in Genesis 126. Let us make man in our image. Wow. It's a crazy thing. I've never even caught this. Man. So you see what Jesus said? We are speaking from firsthand personal experience. Yeah. What we see and know from a personal experience and we're making known to you. This can't be the apostles because they were clueless for most of Jesus's ministry, right? Yep. Now keep reading. Now Then you're going to get 12 and 13. Truly, truly, I say to you, we speak of what we know and bear witness to what we have seen. But you do not receive our testimony if i have told you earthly things <clears throat> and you do not believe how can you believe if i tell you heavenly things no one has ascended into heaven except the except he who descended from heaven the son of man see that now what's the context of descending and ascending it's re revelation bringing down the revelation of heaven okay so did elijah come down with the revelation nope yeah you get it yep i get it so but what's the point of 13 he's still in heaven while he's on earth but he's not in heaven physically because physically he's on earth just like right now he's not on earth physically physically he's in heaven but he's still omnipresent okay so you see it's not either or jesus is all-knowing present everywhere almighty but at the same time he has to grow he's limited he's weak he's tired he's hungry so for example as man he sleeps but as God, he says, come to me, all you who are weary and heavy laden, and I'll give you rest. Yeah. Matthew eleven twenty eight, 28, right? Mm -hmm. As God, in John 4, when you read verse 1 to 9, he tells the Samaritan woman, give me something to drink. And then he tells her, if you knew who's asking you for a drink, you'd ask him and he'd give you living waters. And yeah. whoever drinks of these waters shall never thirst. So notice, he needs physical water, but he can give you living waters that will satisfy your thirst forever and ever. Yeah. He needs to eat food. But then he says, I'm the bread of life. Yeah. I'm the bread who came down from heaven. So it's not either or. It's both and. See, this is what the Bible's teaching you. It's both and. One eternal divine person who is truly human, experiencing genuine human existence. 